With a club innovation, let's make Wonka for the first time at the International School of Ministry and Leadership Conference, Switch 2024. Apostle Michael Oyoko. Give the Lord a big hand. Hallelujah. Praise God. Father, we thank you for the opportunity again this morning to receive from you. Thank you for the mighty things you are already doing. Thank you for the light that we've received. Thank you for the grace to bring forth. And Lord, even as we progress, we ask that your spirit will continue to pour out upon us mightily in the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody give the Lord a shout of praise. You may be seated. Again, it's my honor this morning to bring us the word of the Lord. I want to sincerely honor God's servant, Pastor Charles Osazua and Pastor Mrs. Deborah Osazua. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, I want to also salute all the city ministers that are here. Reverend Emmanuel is here. Thank you so much, sir. I'm honored to be ministering before you. And of course, Pastor Korode Kumaya, thank you. It's so good to see you. Glory to Jesus. Can we just in one second ask the Lord to open our hearts to receive? Just ask the Lord, tell him you are ready to receive. The Bible said the meek shall he teach in judgment. Let the heart open up to receive the word of the Lord. He said receive the engrafted word with meekness. Father, I yield myself to your spirit. I humble myself before your word this morning. Quicken me, Lord. Strengthen my spirit, man. Cause me to internalize that which you'll be speaking forth. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. So this morning, I'll be teaching very quickly on um, the topic, Igniting Revival Fire in Our Generation. Glory to God. Last night we began, and um, it was quite intense, so this morning i like to step down a bit so I can share a few things because I have quite a few things to share. Um, there are three things I'll be talking about this morning very quickly. The first is the importance of the fire of God because we need to know the significance of fire in order to pay the price to have it and to walk in it. And then the second thing I'll be sharing on this morning is what the fire of God really is. Because there are many fires. There is the fire of the Holy Spirit and there is also strange fire. And so if we don't know what the fire of God is, we might mistake a strange fire for the fire of God. And then finally, I'll be speaking on igniting the fire of God on our lives. Praise God. And so quickly... There are six major significances of spiritual fire that I've itemized here. Number one is that fire is the precursor for witnessing. When you find somebody witnessing the mandate of the kingdom effectively, it's because that man is under and is carrying the fire of the Holy Spirit. Jesus discipled people for three years and he told them, please don't go out with lecture notes. He said, tarry in Jerusalem, Luke 24, 49, until you are endued with fire from on high. It goes to mean that without fire, you cannot be a witness. Because what he called power here, we saw in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, to be fire. He said, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, he said, they were together in one accord, in one place. And suddenly, they heard a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. And what happened was that the Holy Ghost descend in the similitude of cloven tongues of fire. And the moment that fire came, they stepped out with boldness and began to bring witness. These were feeble men, scary men, that were locked away in the upper room. But the moment the fire came, it provoked an appetite to witness. And from that day, 3,000 was added to the church. Acts 2, 37. The next time we heard of them, Acts 2, Acts 4 verse 4, 5,000 was added to the church. The next time we heard of them, Acts 6 verse 4, it said a great company of the priests became obedient to the faith. And then we saw further, Acts chapter 8 verse 1 to verse 6, it was no longer a company. Individuals began to take cities. It said Philip went to Samaria. 
he preached Christ there. The city was full of joy. Acts 8 verse 5. So from a company preaching, winning 3,000 to 5,000 to the institutions, then individuals began to take cities. And so when fire comes, you become a witness. Listen, sir. Bible school is important. Seminary is important. But if you don't have fire, you can never witness to God. The power for witnessing is born when the fire of God descends upon your life. The second significance of fire is that fire activates seasons. They sat in one place until the fire descended. Nobody told them that the move of God had begun. If that fire did not come, that season would not have opened. We saw these guys, when Jesus left, they didn't know where they were. They didn't know where the season where they were. But the moment the fire came, Peter knew. He said, this is what was prophesied by the prophet Joel. How did he know the timing? Because fire comes to recalibrate spiritual clock. The day you are set on fire, that day your season has begun. This is what the prophet spoke about. Nobody told them it was time. Fire was the indicator. The moment fire comes, a season is born. Even Jesus was walking about as a normal carpenter until in Matthew 3, 17, after he was baptized, the Bible said the Holy Ghost descended like a dove and he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 4, 1, he was led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. The moment temptation was over, Luke 4, 14, he returned in the power of the spirit. Matthew 4, 15, 16, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. Luke 4, 18, he came into the temple, took the scroll and began to read, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me to preach glad tidings to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, recovering of sight to the blind, liberty to the bruised. When he was done reading it, he said, this day, this scripture has been fulfilled in your eyes. Fire opens up our seasons and dispensations in the spirit. Men may commission you, but if you don't have fire, that season will not open. But trust me, when the fire of God comes upon your life, even if men reject you, your season will wake up. You don't need to be part of any established institution to set your generation ablaze. The Bible spoke about John. He was a burning and a shining light. That was enough. He was not even in the city center. He was by the wilderness. But he said the whole of Jerusalem and Judea went to him. They knew a dispensation had been born. Once upon a time, we needed to go to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. This guy was not endorsed by them. In fact, they came to challenge his ministry. Who are you? He said, I'm the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Prepare a way for the Lord. This is not a call for rebellion. Listen, we align with what was. We honor what was, but we know our time. I am the voice of the one crying. And in the wilderness, the whole nation went to him. And when Jesus came, what was the testimony? He was a burning and a shining light. Your season will not manifest. See, forget all this thing of lobbying and doing politics in church. It will not take you anywhere. Pastor may love you and that is good. But that does not guarantee that you will make a mark in your generation. Do everything you need to do to be loved. But don't do politics. Because in this kingdom, only God makes man. He said, let us make man in our own image. After our likeness, let them have dominion. Let us make man. One of the ways God make man is to cook them in the furnace of fire. I will thoroughly purge the sons of Levi that they may bring an acceptable offering before the Lord. We have left the ancient paths. When we read about our fathers, they went to mountain tops to pray until they were clothed with fire. But in our generation, we want to make impact through eye service. Eye service cannot open your season. Be cooked. Fire activates season. Number three, fire provokes shine out of your life. He makes you to glow. John 3.35, he was a burning and a shiny light. If you don't burn, you can't shine. Your shine is tied to your intensity. 
If you have no intensity, there will be no glow out of your life. Everyone you see shining is burning on the inside. The light you see is a product of the furnace. If there's no intensity on the inside, there can be no glow on the outside. So fire provokes shining. And number four, fire imparts kingdom influence. When you have fire of necessity, you will be relevant in the kingdom. When John began to burn, John 3.35, the next thing that happened was that the whole of Jerusalem and Judea went to him. Matthew 3 verse 5. The whole of Jerusalem. How can one man attract the attention of a city? That is beyond publicizing. That is beyond diplomacy. There is a force that cannot be denied. It's called the anakazo of God. The compelling power. Go to the highway. Compare them. See, there are different kinds of power in the kingdom. There is a power called al -K. That's the power of rulership. First in rank. There is a power called dunamis. That's the capacity to create change. There is a power called exousia. That is delegated authority. There is a power called kratos. That's dynamic power. There is a power called iskus. That's collaborative power. But when it has to do with kingdom influence, the name for that power is anakazo. The force that compels men. That when you talk, your walls become a sting in the heart of men. They go to bed, they cannot sleep. They hear those echoes because it looks like angels have lent their voice to your voice. And if we will create influence where governors, presidents can hear, then something must be added to our power. It has nothing to do with boldness of voice. It has nothing to do with baritone voice. Your voice can sound like a woman singing. But if there is an akazo there, men will hear you, they won't be able to sleep. But all of that is sponsored by the fire of the Holy Ghost. So if you want to have influence in this kingdom, in order to advance the kingdom, you need fire. If you want to shine, you need fire. Fire is a precursor in this kingdom. If you want your seasons activated, you must be on fire. And if you want to be a witness, you must be on fire. This is why fire is so important. It was not added as a menu in this conference just to make someone excited. It's because a lot depends on it. What is the measure of your intensity? Sometimes when I look at our fathers, I weep because at their age, they are still more on fire than us. You see that these men are literally old, but something is burning in them that they wish they had a thousand tongues to speak it. I'm watching Bishop David Oedeko and he's talking. He, he doesn't even know how to. The thing is so strong and you know that this man is, is on flames. And then you find a young man whose strength, whose glory is his strength, is weak and lukewarm. I was talking to his secretary the other time. They left Dunamis around nine. They said they were going back to the office. He said the night is still young. How can the night be young around nine? People are leaving office 1 a.m. They are returning for early morning prayers by five. Four hours sleep is so much. And then a young man goes to bed. He sleeps from 8 p.m. to 10 a.m. He wakes up. He says, we will take our word. Which word? Those who rule don't sleep. They are awake when you are sleeping. That's why they are ahead of you. But it takes fire to be awake. This is not just discipline. This is something raging on your inside that you cannot contain. Kingdom puts a lot of demand on us. And for us to meet up the demands of the kingdom, we must burn. We must burn. Having said this, what is fire? Because fire is not excitement. Fire is not youthful exuberance. Fire is not a product of adrenaline. Fire is a spiritual resource. And when you are on fire, there are certain indicators that show it. The first thing about fire is passion, unquenchable passion for God. I'm not talking passion for money. I'm not talking passion for preaching. I'm not talking passion for visibility. I'm talking passion for God. When you find a man who is on fire, the love of God wells up on his inside and he desires him daily. The Bible said, as the deer panted after the waters, 
He says, so my soul longeth, not after preaching, after you, my soul. Your soul is in a constant pursuit of God and his presence. When you begin to desire God above all, when a hunger is sustained in your spirit for God, know that you are on fire for God. In John 2, 17, Jesus speaking, he said, the zeal of my father's house. He wants to interact with the presence constantly. He said, that zeal has consumed me. We are in a generation where people love everything but God. They can watch movies every day for 10 hours. But when you say, let's talk to God, five minutes they are tired. And so even our vigils today, we have to argument it with drama. We have to argument it with dancing and playing so that we manage time. But the fathers of old, if they say vigil, they start praying from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Because they are engaging God and they had sufficient stamina to remain there. I'm not saying we should not do other things in vigil. There are many channels to God's presence. But what I'm saying is, if what we do is to detract us from, 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 from our weakness because we have no stamina, then something is wrong. When was the last time you prayed alone all night? Not because you are going to preach somewhere. Not because you are going for a conference. Not because you needed to pray for the sick. You just prayed all night because you know that the desire, it was a desire that woke you up. You stayed there and focused. He said, kiss me with the kisses of thy mouth. He said, thy love is better than wine. Songs of Solomon chapter 1 verse 2. Thy love is better than wine. He said, because of the savory ointment of thy name. He said, the virgins love you. We will not remember the tales of the wine. But we will keep in mind that we have come to the bedchamber of our loved one. This is the kind of intensity that men carry. People love fame. Forget that somebody is on the mountain praying in tongues. Go and check the content of the prayer. Lord, me too, I must shine. So what is powering that prayer is jealousy, is envy. How can Matthew like this be making impact and I am here? If that is what's driving you, you don't have fire. That's a strange fire. Oh, Lord, I must make it this year. I must make it this year. Why will I still be like this? Look at where my mates are. Some of your mates are in the grave. I must make it this. That's not what pursues us. The power that drives us is more of you. More of you. More of you. More of you. If that becomes the substance of your spiritual passion, know that your fire is genuine. So fire is passion for God. If you have no passion for God, you don't have the fire of God. Number two, what is spiritual fire? Spiritual fire is the power for witness. When a man is on fire, he's a soul winner. You cannot claim you are on fire and you are not fruitful. You are not productive. The moment the fire came upon the disciples in Acts chapter 2 verse 1 and 2, we saw in verse 37 that they won 3,000 souls. We saw in Acts 4 verse 4 that they won 5,000 souls. And the fire spread into the camp. Individuals began to win cities. What kind of fire is it that we have now that we only manifest when we are leading prayer? When you come to the prayer meeting, people are not even praying. But when you give somebody the microphone, it's koporo, hakuku, huba, huba. And then we are doing all kinds of posture and all kinds of drama. But there is no appetite for soul. If you are on fire, you will pick the heartbeat of God. And the heartbeat of God is to win everyone to the kingdom. The, fire, the father does not deserve that any should perish. He desires that all should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And so the moment a man catches fire, he is everywhere winning souls. This was the, the, the pattern that Jesus presented to us. In Matthew chapter 8 verse 1 to 5, we saw Jesus. The Bible said he went to every city and every village. Not one, every city and every village preaching the gospel of the kingdom that by all means men will be saved. And so if you are looking for biblical definition of fire, number one is passion for God. Number two is passion for souls. And number three, biblical definition and expression for fire is the flame of purity. This generation where people take pride in praying for long so that they are known as prayer warriors, but they are living with all kinds of iniquity, masturbation, immorality, and then we know how to manage it as though we are bipolar. When we come to church, we are spiritual. When we are outside of church, we become strange beings. And because nobody sees what we are doing, we think it's okay. They, we are standing before a cloud of witnesses. It's only men that are not seeing you. The number of beings seeing you will shock you if your eyes open. <laughs> you think you are alone in a closed room. 
with, without light, you are joking. There are eyes that see beyond the rays of electricity. There are eyes. There are eyes that they sensor. They see beyond that ray. And if you are able to manage iniquity and praying in tongues loud, you are a joker. You don't know what the fire of God is. When the fire comes, it purges. Malachi chapter 3 verse 2. He will sit as a refiner. And he will refine the tongues of Levi that they may bring an acceptable worship unto God. In Zechariah chapter 13 verse 9, he said he will take a third part of them and he will pass to them through the fire so that when they are poured, they can call him their God and he will call them his people. If we are able to manage and live with iniquity, we are not on fire regardless of what we do. It's drama. Fire is purity. The flames of purity burning in your vessel. Jesus was so on fire that he was not just living pure. The Bible says, because thou lovest righteousness and hated iniquity. He said, thy God has anointed you with the oil of gladness. He hated iniquity. That's the level of purity that he carried. He was not just not away from defilement. He hated it. There was something about his appetite. See, when you're on fire, your appetite will change. You will not just avoid, you will hate it. And the day you begin to coexist with evil and iniquity, know that your fire has gone down. It's not possible for the two to blend. The Bible said, if you go to the altar to render your sacrifice and your brother has an ought against you, Matthew 5, 23, 24, he said, leave that offering there. No activity on the altar is allowed except as the heart is pure. Because the fire of God insists on purity. But I'm telling you that we are a strange species of beings. This is a generation where a man's heart can be full of iniquity but is carrying out spiritual things comfortably. And you are wondering what has happened to the conscience. It has been seared with a hot iron. And so at best, many are professional preachers. They know what to say. They know how to touch the emotional cords of people. But there's no witness of God. And that's why our messages have no weight. Men hear us. It doesn't affect them for five minutes. But the fathers of old, when they write a sermon, they don't need to preach it. If they write a sermon, read it, your heart begins to burn. What is the substance of God that is credited to their utterances? What, what did God put on their words? That a man can read a sermon and set a city on fire. Some of us who are on fire today is because of one sermon we heard 20 years ago. So the question is, who, what does that person who preached that sermon, what does he carry? This man knew the place of holiness. And that's why ahead of all their messages is the cross. Until tomorrow, hear them. You will see what will happen to your heart. It doesn't matter the topic they are dealing with. They can be talking about finances. If you are a sinner, you start weeping. They can be talking about church growth. If you are a sinner, you start weeping. What is it that they carried? Till tomorrow, I go back to listen to some of the ancient preachers. And if you hear them, people like Pastor Mrs. Maria uh, uh, Corrie Tembon, people like David Duplessis, Derek Prince. You hear this man, your heart is on fire. Brother Billy Akani. And then you are wondering, what are they saying? What, what is it that they can? They are burning with a flame. So their wars are not to inform you. Their wars are to purify you. God coats their utterances with coals of fire. When it touches you, something will happen to your soul. And if we will change our world, this is the texture of Christianity that we have to present to a generation. Make the mistake to listen to some of these men and see how it will ruin your life. You will discover that your life will become a narrow path. They will narrow you to the cross and the cross alone. They don't need to meet you. And I tell you sometimes one sermon is enough. I heard Zach Poon and the other time, five minutes into the sermon I was weeping. What are you saying? What is it that God has put upon you? They were burning. They were a flame of fire. And trust me, our number will count for nothing except as we begin to raise men that come out of the furnace. Men that carry words that are like coals of fire. This is what we change a generation. This is what we truly impact a generation. I know the place of influence. I know the place of multitude. I know the place of financial power. But at the, be at the base of it all is the quality of witness that we bring. One that the fire has endorsed. One that the fire has endorsed. So if this is how significant fire is, 
How do we ignite revival fire? Number one is through brokenness. In fact, brokenness is what sponsors prayer. Any prayer that, that is not sponsored by brokenness is pride. It's the way of the Pharisees. You know what the Pharisees do? They have built their will so much, so they take pride in praying long. And when they do, they want to be seen of men. A Pharisee can stand by the street corner and pray for 18 hours. And I'm not against long prayer. I advocate for it a lot. Because when we pray, a lot happens to our soul. It's like a refinery. It purifies us. But if prayer is not sponsored by brokenness, but pride, then that prayer will not engender divine reality. It will become pharisaicism, where men pray to be seen of men. And then our trophy is that they look at us and say, ah, man of prayer, prayer warrior, prayer machine, bazooka, and then we are walking like spiritual men. Meanwhile, our very gesture suggests carnality. It's pharisaicism. I'm talking revival fire that comes through prayer, worship, or whatever. It's sponsored by brokenness. 2 Corinthians 7, 14, it says, If my people who are called by my name, he didn't deny them, they are my people. So I'm not talking about strangers. I'm not talking about sinners. I'm talking my people who are called by my name. He said, if they will humble themselves. Though the first thing God is looking at in the prayer that sponsors revival is brokenness. It's not the prayer first. If they will humble themselves and pray and turn away from their evil, he say, I will hear them. Then I will visit their land. So if there is no brokenness at the center of our spiritual engagement, there will be no fire for revival. A contrite heart and a broken spirit. Psalm 51 verse 17. Thou, O Lord, shall not despise. And so if you find a generation that is at the brink of revival, the first indicator you will see is the indicator of humility and brokenness. We are so proud in this, this era. People are trying to prove a point every day. You see somebody with another person that he should honor. His goal is to snap a picture and square his shoulder and act as if he are their colleagues. What does that add to you? When you should honor somebody, honor him. It takes nothing from you. Rather, it increases you. But our little knowledge has made us become like peacocks. And so even when we are praying, we can't touch the heavens. Because the first iniquity that the Bible revealed to us that caused crisis in heaven was pride. He said, you are the anointed cherub that cover it. He said, from the day of thy creation, thy taps and thy tablets were in thee. Ezekiel 28 from verse 13 to 17. He said, thou that sealed the sun, your covering was diamond, jasper, sapphire, carbuncle, ten precious stones. The guy was the summation of beauty and excellence. He said, you were in Eden, the mountain of God, until iniquity was found in you. What was that iniquity? I will exalt my throne. Pride. So a man sitting at the highest can go down because of pride. And a man sitting at the lowest can go to the highest because of humility. So while Satan was trying to go up, Jesus was coming down. Let this mind be in you. Philippians 2 verse 5, which was also in Christ Jesus. Although he was equal with God, he counted it not robbery. Rather, he, he ejected, he put away the privileges of deity. And he took upon himself the fashion of a man. And he said, because of this, God highly exalted him. So we are doing everything we should do right, but our heart is wrong. Prayer, intense prayer. Waiting, intense waiting. The word, intense. People preach now, you, look, you think they are angels. You are wanting, what do you read? How do you study? But why can't we see the results? But the father just shows up and say, repent. And then you see people weeping. What's the difference? God endorses what they do. Because what they do carries the signature of brokenness. The second thing that sponsors revival fire is genuine repentance. Genuine repentance. I'm not talking biochemical reaction. When you do something wrong, the first day you wept. That's not repentance. It's not the cry, oh Lord, I'm sorry. No. When you repent, you turn away. When you repent, you are broken. When you repent, you are convicted. And that conviction attains turning away. If you have not turned away, you have not repented. Somebody for the case, he prays for one week. He's still calling the person. How are you doing? Uh, let's trust God to help us. <laughs> you don't know what you are saying. By the time biochemical process is over, you will go back there. 
And so that drama you are acting, the ancient of days knows the end. Hope you know that God is omnipresent and omniscient. Omnipresence means he is everywhere at every time and in every time. At every time means he is everywhere in the world now. In every time means he is still in yesterday and he's already in tomorrow. God has not left yesterday. If God leaves yesterday, yesterday will disappear from creation. And if yesterday collapses, the cycle of existence will break down. So God is still in yesterday. God is already in today and God is already in tomorrow. So he's in tomorrow before you arrive. So when you are crying that crying and you have not made your mind to turn away, he already, he's already in the next scene. He, he is waiting for you there. He knows what you are doing is hypocrisy. So if you are looking for a revival, you must be genuine in your repentance. Genuine. Same scripture. Second Chronicles 7.14 My people who are called by my name, if they humble themselves, number one, and turn away, if they don't repent, there will be no revival. There will be no outpouring of the spirit. There will be no visitation. And so if we are trusting God for revival in our lives and revival in our ministries, there must be genuine repentance. Everything we are convicted of by the Holy Spirit, we must trust God to help us turn away from them. The third precursor for activating the revival fire is seeking and finding the Rema word. Psalm 80 verse 18. He said, quicken us, O God, that we may call upon thy name. How does he quicken us? Ezekiel 2 verse 1. When I saw him, I felt like a dead man. And he spoke unto me. And the word entered me and lifted me to my feet. So if God does not send his word, and if you don't catalambano the word of God, there will be no fire in your life. See, people who are genuinely on fire, they are on fire because they are raging. They are saturated with the word of God. In Leviticus chapter 6 verse 12, he said the fire on the altar must not be put out. How do you keep it? He said the priest must put wood on it every morning. What is the wood? It's the word of God. The priest must put wood on it every morning. Jesus carried the cross and they looked at him and they were weeping. He said if this happens to a wet wood, what will happen when it happens to a dry wood? So he called himself the wood of God. And when you begin to put the word on your heart, a day will come, there will be a rekindling. This is why we come for conferences like this. Thank God for the principles we learn, but our heart is searching. Where is the Rema word? Where is the Rema word? The moment that word comes, for you it may be a sentence. For you it may be a phrase. For you it may be a story. But the moment it enters you, it sets you on fire. And when you catch it, you preserve it by endorsing yourself with much more. With more word. Because we all with open faces beholding us in the glass. The glory of the Lord, we are chained. This is how to keep the fire. This is how to ignite the fire. See, see what Pastor Yemi was teaching us a moment ago. My goodness, what a blessing. You, we don't know why everywhere you turn, the devil wants to inject you with strange intelligence. Strange reality. Even your notepad today that is not supposed to be a graphic material. Open it if you are connected to the internet. Something naked pops up. Because these spirits are intelligent beings. They know that what enters you is what determines your intensity. And so they want to choke you with corruption. If you are wise, what you do is to set the world before you always. And as you are looking, you are becoming. As you are looking, you are becoming. And you know one of the expressions of the nature of God? Hebrews 12, 29. Our God is a consuming fire. So the more you look, one of the transformations that take place is that you become like that flame. So you eat the word always. You find it. Jeremiah said, I found thy word. And I did eat them. I ate the word. I didn't read them. I ate them. And he said, they became the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. When the word enters you, it does something to you. We are empty of the word. Full of all kinds of knowledge. We can debate Messi and Ronaldo. We know all the records. All the hat tricks that Ronaldo has called. All the hat trick that Messi has scored. I'm not against having some social form of life. But imagine if that's how Elijah lived. You read the Bible and they told you Elijah went for a, a, a gladiator fight. And Elijah is arguing the best gladiator. They had too many important business to have time for worldliness. Too much, too much, too much. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. How many words have God spoken? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Do you know the level of commitment required?
to eat every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. But some of us don't even have one. Every time they speak, they say, the Bible said somewhere. Uh, it's written somewhere. It's in the Bible. And you want to be on fire. He said, I've seen an abomination on the face of the earth. Princes are trekking while beggars are riding on horses. So the equation that alters it is your content. Many don't carry much of God in their spirit. The third thing that ignites the revival fire. This is the fourth. Is to make yourself the sacrifice. If you are not committed in service to God, you will never be on fire. If you are a visitor to the house of God, visitor to God's agenda, you will never be on fire. Leviticus chapter 9, from verse 22 to 24. When Aaron was done placing the offering on the altar, he returned with Moses and they stepped out. And the glory of God appeared. And the fire of God fell upon the sacrifice and licked it up. Everywhere the sacrifice, fire is attracted. This is why Paul, speaking to us in Romans 12, from verse 1 and 2, he said, I beseech you, dearly beloved, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. If you are not taking the disposition of a sacrifice, the fire will never rest on you. And unfortunately, we are a selfish generation. Everything we do is for gain. Tell somebody, pick paper in church. He say, how much? Please, tie that knot. He says, it's 2,000. I'm not saying we should not have professionals and artisans who work in church to be paid. I'm not saying those who work in church should be marginalized. But which one is your sacrifice to God? Everything that is a price tag. And then they are expecting to burn. Nowadays, you tell people, let's go out for evangelism. They say, is there a payment to go and win souls? Something that provokes eternal reward. And then we are hoping to be on fire. That fire can't rest on us. We are too selfish to carry the fire. What we did, what will it be meant for? Because the fire is for kingdom advancement and you are not a candidate for kingdom expansion. So how can the fire rest on you? This is one of the major reasons why we have no longer fire amongst us and in our generation. There must be a disposition of sacrifice. Number five, what provokes revival fire is the spirit of oneness. Where there is division, the fire can't rest. Acts 1 14, they were together in one accord. Acts 2 1, they were together in one accord. And what happened? Suddenly, there was a sound as of a rushing mighty wind, and the fire of God fell. When people become one, fire rests upon them. And if you study Acts chapter 4, from verse 28, after they were beaten, the Bible said they returned to their own company. And corporately, they lifted up their voices and prayed. Verse 29 and 30, the place where they were was shaken, and the Spirit filled them up afresh. And then verse 33, with great power, God demonstrated his witness for the name and resurrection of Jesus, and great grace was upon them. They knew the place of oneness, and that became their lifestyle. And as you study the book of Acts from place to place, you are going to notice how their fellowship was growing. Yes, their fellowship was growing in number. Acts 2, 47, daily God added to the church such as should be saved. But that was not the only growth they had. They were also growing in oneness. From Luke 24, 49, they were in one place. Acts 2, verse 1, they were in one accord. Acts 2, 46, they were of one heart. So they migrated from a church location to singleness of heart. And because they were one heart, fire was resident there perpetually. Today, go to a cell, there's crisis. Five people, ten people are gathered together. They are some not talking to themselves. Why is that so? It's because we are not ready for God. And the Bible said in Proverbs 13.10, it said, every contention is caused by pride. So anywhere there is quarrel, anywhere there is crisis, know that pride is at the root of it. Only by pride commit contention. And this is why God cannot put his hand upon us. We are not one. We are not one. That's why I was telling you yesterday, this rise of correcting everybody by every sermon, there's something wrong. Because when you study the spirit behind all of those, you find pride, you find arrogance, you find bitterness. I know the place of, in fact, there can be no revival if there's no rebuke, if there's no correction. Every time revival begins, God raises men that challenge negative status quo. But it is done in the spirit of holiness. It is done in the spirit of humility. It is done in the spirit of love. And there are many people like that over the years. Study about the revivalists from Charles Finney to John Wesley. All of them, they brought correction at certain level. 
But when you hear them, you don't feel they are attacking somebody. When you hear them, you don't feel there's something under their heart that is making them say what they are saying. When you hear them, you begin to weep because of the purity that came with their communication. But there's something wrong with us. There's something wrong. Till tomorrow, I hear Billy Akani and I cry. Till tomorrow, there are many of them, Zak Punem, Judy Botnam, they bring these corrections every day, but it, it pricks your heart. The way Peter spoke and he said their hearts was pricked. You will know that this thing is coming from the place of sincerity, love, purity, and brokenness. It is not an attempt to victimize somebody. But you see, in our time, what we are doing is sponsored by the spirit of division. And at the root of it is arrogance, pride, and bitterness. And this is why instead of creating revival, it's creating contention and division. If we want fire, we must be one. And I'm not saying one is uniformity. Our diversity will be sustained. But underneath our diversity is long-suffering, is endurance, is tolerance, is love. So that we don't pull down, rather we build up. And if God sees the genuineness of our heart, one of the ways he will put his endorsement is that he will release his fire. Number six. How do you kindle revival fire? Is to respond to demands of seasons. He said, tarry in Jerusalem. Luke 24, 49. Until you are endued. The demand of that season is to tarry. If they were strolling about, they will never be on fire. So they responded to the demand of the season. And because they did, the fire came upon them. In Acts 2 verse 1. Most of us, as I'm talking to us now, there are many demands that the Holy Ghost is putting that we are not obeying. There are some of us, God has to, have told us, go and serve somewhere. We have not moved. But we are hoping that we will be set on fire for our generation. There are some of us now, God is telling us, wait. We are not waiting. There are some of us now, God is telling us, study. We are not studying. There are some of us now, God is telling us, take a retreat and pray. We are not praying. But we are hoping that somehow fire will come. The fire doesn't come like that. For the revival fire to be kindled in your heart, you must discern and respond to the demands of the season. And finally, for you to sustain that fire, you must fan the fire to flame. The little ember that God kindles, you take responsibility to fan it to flame. If you don't take responsibility for fire, you will not be on fire. Second Timothy 1 verse 6, he said, this commandment I give unto you, dear son Timothy, that you fan to flame the gift of God that is upon your life. Leviticus 6, 12, the fire on the altar must not be put out. He said the priest must put wood on it every morning. The reason we are not on fire is because we are not taking spiritual responsibility for the little embers that the Lord has kindled. If you begin to walk on that little ember, it can become a furnace that will burn and set your generation on fire. John Wesley said something. He said, I set myself on fire and my generation come to watch me burn. There's a responsibility that keeps the fire. And until that responsibility comes, there will be no kingdom advancement. You know something about fire? In the realm of God, fire purifies. In the natural realm, fire destroys. But in the demonic realm, fire torments. So when you are on fire, you keep being purified. You destroy things that are not consistent with God's agenda on earth. And then you torment devils so that the will of God finds expression in perpetuity. Bow your heads and pray for a minute.